Question 10 from the 2018 Higher Physics Section 2. In a laboratory experiment, light from a hydrogen discharge lamp is used to produce a line emission spectrum. The line spectrum for hydrogen has four lines in a visible region as shown below. These are the lines which appear in the spectrum. For part A, it says the production of line spectrum can be explained using the Bohr model of the atom. And what we have to do here to get our two marks is state two features of the Bohr model of the atom. Well, we'll start off with a picture of the Bohr model of the atom. And the Bohr model of the atom was proposed by Niels Bohr. He said that the central part of the atom was a strong, positively charged nucleus. And surrounding the nucleus was orbits where the electrons could exist. And we can sum this up by writing down these phrases. First of all, Bohr suggested central, dense, positively charged nucleus. He went on to describe that the electrons can only be found in discrete energy levels, which means like the books in a bookshelf, the electrons must appear in the energy levels and only in the energy levels. The energy levels are ranked from this one here, which we call the ground state, and then as we go higher, the electrons will have a higher energy, but no electron can exist in between here. Another phrase could be, electrons can only move between energy levels. They can't exist in between energy levels. So this electron here can move down to here. This electron here can move up to here. And this electron here can move down to here as well, the ground state. So electrons can only move between energy levels. And the last part here is this last paragraph. And it says, when an electron moves from a high energy level to a lower one, a photon of light is, is given off with exactly the same energy as the difference between the energy levels. This causes the lines in the spectrum. So you have four phrases here. You can pick two. Uh, the two I would pick would be from these ones here. Electrons can only be found in discrete energy levels. Electrons can only move between energy levels. They can't exist between the energy levels. We say that the the, the electrons are the energy levels are discrete, and finally, when an electron moves from a high energy level to a lower lower one, a photon of light is given off with exactly the same energy as the energy difference between the energy levels, and this causes the lines in the spectrum. This energy level here would be called the ground state, and subsequently, different energy levels higher up will be given higher and higher energies. Question 10b from section 2 of the 2018 Higher Physics Examination. Some of the energy levels of the hydrogen atom are shown below. You can see the ground state, E0, E1, E2, E3 and E4. Question 1. One of the spectral lines is due to electron transitions from E3 to E1. Determine the frequency of the photon emitted when an electron makes this transition. So the electron is going from E3 and it's moving down to E1. It's making a downward transition. So it's going to give off a photon of light. And we know that the energy of that photon light will be exactly equal to the energy difference between these two energy levels. Now a quick word about energy levels. You might see they've all got a negative sign in front of them. Now just ignore that. All that really is a convention. It means that if you're an electron sitting here, you need 21.8 times 10 to minus 19 joules to escape the atom to get to the ionization level. If you're an electron here, you're near the ionization level. You just need 0 0.871 times 10 to minus 19 joules to escape the atom to get to the ionization level. So the minus sign in front of the energy level value just tells you how much energy an electron would need to escape the atom from that energy level. Now when it comes to work out the energy difference between E3 and E1, this energy difference, then the quick way is just take a look at the biggest number of the energy level, in this case it's 5.45, and just take away the small number, which is 1.36. Forget about the minus signs, just go for the big number, take away the smaller number. 
So the energy difference, which will be equal to the energy of the photon in this case, is going to be 5.45, that's the big number, 5.45 times 10 to minus 19 joules, take away the lower number, which is 1.36 times 10 to the minus 19. Now we do that in our calculator, we get an answer of 4.09 times 10 to the minus 19 joules. So that is the value of the energy difference that electron made a transition through. Now we also know another equation which links the energy of the photon, so energy E is equal to Planck's constant times the frequency of the photon and that's what has to find the frequency of the photon so all we have to do is take the energy divided by Planck's constant and we should have the frequency now we know the energy it's the same as the energy difference between energy levels it's, it's 4.09 times 10 to the minus 19 divided by Planck's constant and to find Planck's constant we have to look up the table and Planck's constant is here, h is 6.63 times 10 to minus 34 joule seconds. So 6.63 times 10 to minus 34. Now we do that, we get the value for the frequency, and the frequency turns out to be 6.17, if you do it in your calculator, times 10 to the power 14, and remember frequency is measured in hertz. Question 10, part C. In the laboratory, a line in the hydrogen spectrum is observed at a wavelength of 656 nanometers. When a spectrum of light from a distant galaxy is viewed, this hydrogen line is now observed at a wavelength of 661 nanometers. Determine the recessional velocity of the distant galaxy. And we're dealing with five marks here, so we have to be really careful what equation we're going to use. And the equations are not instantly springing to mind. So let's look at our data book with the section about uh, Hubble's law and about lines. You can see that part there. Now, you can see first of all that if we work out the Z ratio, it is the observed wavelength, take away the rest wavelength, divided by the rest wavelength. And we find the Z ratio... We can then plug it into this equation here, which says the Z ratio is equal to the recessional uh, speed of the galaxy divided by C. So by combining these two equations here, working out this one first, and then finding the answer into Z and putting the answer to into Z here, we can find the recessional speed of the galaxy. So let's start off with our first equation. It's going to be this one we're going to use. It's going to be the Z Ratio is going to be equal to lambda observed. I'll just put a lambda O down there. Take away the lambda when it's viewed at rest in the lab. Divided by lambda R. So we put in the numbers for that. We get the observed wavelength is 661. So 661. You can forget about the nanometers because they'll cancel out. Take away 656. Put a bracket around that one. And divide by... The rest one, which is 656. And we get a Z value equal to 0 0.00762. Now there's no units for the Z ratio because the two nanometers, the lengths cancel out. Now that we've got the Z answer, we can put it into the second equation, which is this one here which tells us the Z ratio is actually equal to the recessional speed of the galaxy divided by the speed of light. So we can put down Z is equal to recessional speed divided by C. And therefore, if I just simply cross multiply, I can get V is going to equal to the Z ratio times the value of the speed of light. So that's going to be equal to 0 0.00762 multiplied by 3 times 10 to the power 8 and we work that out we can see that we're going to get a speed in the order of 2.865 we do it in my calculator 
2.8685, or 2.2, sorry, 2.2865, uh, multiplied by 10 to the power 6 metres per second. We can tidy that up a bit and say that the recessional speed of the galaxy is 2.3 uh, times 10 to the power 6 metres per second.